Suprema Media's Polity Yamtabi Madiba, joining me today is Arthur Williams, author of a recent book on corruption and state capture. His book is titled Deep Collusion, Bain and the Capture of South Africa. Your book is an insider's account of how a management consulting firm became embroiled in a crook scheme that would do untold damage to the country. So tell us in brief what Bain and Company did with regard to its role in restructuring the South African revenue savers, which contributed to the process of state capture in South Africa. Tabi, the, the story with Bain starts with their intimate relationship with former President Jacob Zuma. So whereas most companies involved in state capture, all of the names we know, were involved in what I call the implementation part of state capture, of overpriced contracts, of rigging procurement systems, um, they were involved in, in the implementation. Only one company sat down with the president to plan some of the aspects of state capture, and that company was Bain and Company. So we know that for a two-year period, Bain met with Jacob Zuma every six weeks on average. These meetings were clandestine. They were behind closed doors. They were all after hours. Some of these meetings were at midnight. And they were all at the president's residences, not in his office. So it was clear that these meetings, no one wanted anyone to know about. And in these meetings, Bain prepared plans with Zuma and with others at these meetings for repurposing state institutions. They discussed how they would restructure and repurpose telecom. They discussed how they restructure and repurpose SARS and many other state institutions. So part of the process was the president identified the person he was going to put in charge of that organization. So the president told Bain that Tom Moyani would be the appointed person at SARS. So Bain took that plan they developed with the president and spent almost a year working with Tom Moyani, coaching him, mentoring him on how to implement this plan. And they also refined this plan so that when Moyani got to SARS, it wasn't the case of, let me see what's happening here, what shall I do? He arrived with a plan already in his hand. And that's how Bain became part of this premeditated process, as Judge Nugent called it, to damage SARS, to repurpose SARS as part of the border state capture. And Arthur, how did you come to know about Bain and company's involvement in corruption? And what did you do about it when you became aware of the situation? So, Tabi, I started with Bain in 1996 in Boston, in their global head office. So I've got a long history of working with Bain. I worked with them in the US, in the UK, and in South Africa. And in fact, I'd left Bain in 2010 in Johannesburg. In 2018, when news surfaced of Bain's involvement um, at the Nugent Commission, um, when, when it was revealed that they were involved at SARS, Bain contacted me and asked me for help in what they described to me to do the right thing in South Africa. So for me, someone who knew Bain quite well, who knows South African business, and was an expert in ethics and corporate governance, um, I could see I could play a role with a company that wanted to do the right thing. And in fact, I was quite proud of my former company because they wanted to do the right thing in South Africa. So that's how I got involved. And also that's how I got to see a lot of the evidence so in that role, I got access to a lot of the information that I later revealed to the Zonda Commission. But as I got involved with Bain, within three months of rejoining as a partner, I became convinced that Bain were hiding information from me, even though they called me in for help, and even though they called me in to be saying publicly that they were going to do the right thing. They were even withholding information from me. When I expressed my desire to see certain information and they refused to give me access, that's when I became very concerned. And so it also became very clear to me that Bain's strategy was not to do the right thing in South Africa. It was actually to avoid a prosecution in the US. And so they were just sort of placating us in South Africa while they focused on dealing with a potential investigation in the US. So, as I say, three months after joining Bain, I resigned 
because I was not going to be part of a cover-up. Yeah, you know, while I was there for those three months, I tried my best to try and get them to make full disclosure. But when I saw that was going to fail, I resigned and soon afterwards went to the Zonda Commission and blew the whistle. Talk to us more on how senior legal counsel and head of legal for Bain played a central role in efforts to manipulate you and how they refused to share Bain's investigation findings with you. Yeah, it was an astounding um, set of events that just shows the lack of ethics in their behavior. So the way my role was initially designed was I would provide oversight of the investigation that Bain was going to conduct. And so Bain ostensibly hired an independent investigator to conduct this investigation. But I later discovered that this so-called independent investigator was the law firm Baker McKenzie, who were also Bain's legal advisors. In fact, they had advised Bain before even the Nugent, um, before, before I got involved, before the Nugent Commission um, had happened, during the investigation, so while they were supposedly conducting this independent investigation, the same lawyers at Baker McKenzie were also advising Bain on what to say, what to do, uh, what information to give to the Nugent Commission, etc. And Baker McKenzie advised Bain after the Nugent Commission. So it's very clear that was not an independent investigation because their own lawyers were, were conducting it. But the way the process was set up was I would see the evidence that Baker McKenzie collected, and I would see Baker McKenzie's investigation report. I would then obviously compare the two so that I can then write a report to the Nugent Commission to say, look, I've seen the evidence, I've seen their report, and the report reflects all the evidence. In other words, they've conducted a comprehensive investigation and it's being reported truthfully. But of course, along the way, Bain and Baker McKenzie refused to show me their report. And this just came through phone calls and through emails where they said to me they're not showing me the report. I caused a big um, stir about this, writing to Bain senior global leaders saying, how can I conduct my, my role to verify the truthfulness of your report if I don't see this report? Which to me is just such a bizarre thing even to be saying to them, given that that's what they'd hired me to do. They then um, went back and forth with them saying, well, they can show me the report, but I can't write about it. Then there was this meeting set up where I was gonna see the report on my computer screen and we were gonna talk about it on the phone, but I couldn't print or download the report. So this is not what I wanted. I wanted the report on my computer to study it closely, but at least this was a good compromise, right? So I'd have them on the phone, I'd have the report in front of me so that we can then discuss the findings. During that meeting with the Bain senior counsel on the call and the Baker McKenzie senior partners, we were having the discussion, but the report wasn't on our computer screen. And so I asked them what's happening. And their response was, well, no, they'll read it to me, which of course, again, is just a bizarre thing. I then said, how can you possibly read a report to me? I need to read it so that I can review it myself. Um, and the response was, well, do you think we'll lie to you? Which wasn't the issue at all. So I then ended that call. And it's, it's an example of, of them saying one thing um, but doing another. You know, they said to South Africa, we want to be open and transparent with South Africa about what we've done. Well, how can they be open and transparent with South Africa if they don't show us the findings of their investigation? So, Arthur, do you think state capture elements wished to move beyond SARS to take control of National Treasury and other key institutions? The capture of SARS was part of the intended capture of Treasury. But an important part of the capture of SARS was to disable its enforcement capabilities because SARS plays both a revenue collection function but also an enforcement function. So illicit traders, uh, people who avoid paying tax, evade um, taxes, SARS has a capability to go after them. And so part of the reason SARS needed to be repurposed by the state capture planners was to, to disable that. But capturing SARS was also a part of, of capture of, of Treasury. But if you look at the plans that Bain had designed with Jacob Zuma, they were across our, our, our public sector. Parts of restructuring our energy sector, which included ESCOM and Petrosa, the parts of restructuring our entire ICT sector, which included the SABC, the post office, and Telcom. So the plans were right across our public institutions. And recall, Tabi, Bain didn't just work at SARS, they worked at Telcom at 
Development Bank of South Africa, PIC, IDC, etc., which is why it was such a powerful recommendation from the Zondo Commission that all of Bain's public sector contracts get reevaluated. Because this is part of what I've been advocating for, is to say Bain wants us only to focus on SARS. They're quite happy for you and I to talk about SARS because that's only one small part of what they did. The bigger problems are actually at telecom and elsewhere. And so once we get that information, we will know the true impact of Bain's um, involvement in state capture, but also know about many other actors um, who are involved in state capture. South African whistleblowers don't get much protection. So how do you think whistleblower protection could be improved in the country? Do you believe that whistleblower protection will be improved following President Sir Ramaphosa's commitment in his recent State of the Nation address? I don't know any of the state capture whistleblowers who have received any protection from government. It's not even a case of improving protection. It's starting to provide protection. I'm currently in exile. Uh, I left South Africa in November of last year for fear for my safety. And despite my numerous efforts to contact and reach out to the presidency, I've had no offer of protection at all. So I've had no calls, no emails, no letters, absolute silence from the presidency and from any government um, organization. As I understand it from speaking to the other state capture whistleblowers, the experience is exactly the same. It's quite paradoxical that the president on the one hand says um, whistleblowers play an important role and we should protect them. And on the other hand, absolutely nothing happens. I heard the, the, the Sona speech where the president talked about protecting whistleblowers um, it's left to be seen. Absolutely nothing has happened to date. And I think this impacts our society in a profound way because if there are other people who have information on corruption or other wrongdoing in our country, why would they step up now and speak up? Because all they have to do is say, look at Ethel's experience. Look at Bianca Goodson, Mosila Matepo. Look at their experience. I don't want to go through that, so I'm just going to stay quiet. And so by ill-treating current whistleblowers, we actually discourage future whistleblowers, which means we will lose our fight against corruption in our country. Talking about how you left the country last year, what were your concerns around your safety at that time, and did you receive any threats? You know, the day I testified at the Zondo Commission, the second day of my testimony in March of last year, I got a call from an international NGO, a whistleblower NGO who works around, around the world, and they said they've tracked my testimony and what I've done by implicating 39 different powerful parties and connecting them through hard evidence, I've just increased my, my risk tremendously. And in fact, they recommended that I leave the country. So that was in March of last year already. So saying just based on the hard evidence I've produced um, across those 39 parties has increased my risk. I was shocked by that uh, because I thought um, by testifying, actually, I, I would have very limited risk. I lived in fear for, for the following few months, still not fully believing that um, there'd be any danger to me, um, until another whistleblower was assassinated, um, Babita Diokaran. And then for me, to be honest, I was beside myself because it made it real, this risk that we as whistleblowers face. And then what ultimately pushed me to make a, a de decision was an email from a senior government official, uh, a former go senior government official, who said to me, he's got intelligence that says, I'm in the crosshairs and there's a co coordinated effort to silence me. At that point, I wasn't gonna wait till there was a gun to my head. It was obvious that there were, there were forces out to get me. We know that other whistleblowers have had their homes burgled. Um, we know there are whistleblowers who don't even live at home because there are cars outside their houses. And so we know the risk whistleblowers face. But what made me then leave was the fact that our government wouldn't do anything. You know, so, so calling out, reaching out for help, I just got met with silence. And so my fear was that even people in our government would want me to be silenced. Um, and so for my own safety and my family, I had to leave. And lastly, Arthur, following the release of part one and part two of the state capture report, how do you feel about the fact that Bain and company has still not come clean about its involvement in state capture? I think it's absolutely shocking that a global company, a prestigious company who claims to have you know, high moral uh, principles, um, and integrity continues to deny the involvement when all the evidence is there. You know, the wonderful thing about my testimony was I wasn't testifying about what I heard. I was producing documents, Bain documents, that in black and white showed 
their collusion with, with Zuma and Moyani in black and white show how they were part of rigging the procurement process. So there can be no doubt of Bain's guilt in, the, in this case. The Zonda report said their role at SARS was unlawful, yet they continue to deny. And the reason why I think they continue to deny their involvement is because of what they're hiding. They are hiding so much, which I, as I said earlier, reveals even worse things. And so rather than deal with the facts of the case, they keep attacking me. You, you notice all of Bain's, their press statements, their statements into the Zonda Commission was all about trying to discredit me. And I'm saying, leave me out of the story. Focus on the evidence that's before us. What, what shocks me even beyond that, though, Tabi, is the fact that companies in South Africa are continuing to do business with Bain. Right? We know that Sassel has hired Bain, paying hundreds of millions of rands currently. And Sassel have put out a statement saying that um, they are satisfied that Bain have done nothing wrong and that Bain are not clean. On what basis can any company in South Africa say that? Business leadership South Africa have said the same thing. So there seems to be what you and I see is pretty obvious where a company has done tremendous harm to our society, attacked our democratic institutions. Businesses seem to be acting above um, the rest of us in, in terms of saying, well, you know, you guys can worry about corruption and unethical behavior. We will embrace these people and do business with them. And I think that's where we need to focus our attention of getting corporate South Africa to stop doing business with Bain completely. That was Arthur Williams speaking to Crimea Media's policy about deep collusion, Bain and the capture of South Africa.